Welcome to the presentation of a lecture from Gnostic Radio, a free public service from the Gnostic tradition of Samael Aun Beor. Gnosis is the root wisdom of the world's greatest knowledge. Gnosis is a universal teaching of practical science, whose goal is absolute liberation from suffering and the complete development of the human being. This lecture is one of hundreds available as free downloads, podcasts, or transcriptions. Our lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures to find teachings that suit you. Twice a month, Gnostic Radio broadcasts live and includes a free online classroom allowing listeners to see images, read related scriptures, and ask questions of the speaker. To learn how to participate, visit GnosticRadio.org. Gnostic Radio is a service of Glorianne Publishing, a non-profit organization. The lectures and radio broadcasts have been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. To make a donation, visit GnosticRadio.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. to continue our examination of the book of Revelation. Today we're discussing the four horsemen, which are mentioned in book six, or chapter six, rather, of this book. And there are some graphics, some pictures that accompany the lecture, which you can view on the website at GnosticTeachings.org. In previous lectures, we've been discussing the nature of this text, the book of Revelation. That this book, written by an initiate for initiates, concerns certain detailed aspects of the direct path, the straight path. Or in other words, the path of the Bodhisattva, which in Christianity is called the path of John. This path of the Bodhisattva, the straight path, is only taken by a very few. And in previous lectures, we've discussed the requirements that any seeker has to satisfy in order to gain entrance into that path. The first is that the seeker has to have reached the fifth degree, or the fifth initiation of major mysteries. And these major mysteries are called the serpents of fire. The fire, of course, is that Christic fire, the fire of the Holy Spirit, or the Pentecostal fire, which rises in the spinal column of the seeker. And in India, is called the Kundalini. That fire has to enliven the five lower spheres of the tree of life, which are related, of course, to five bodies that we have, beginning with the physical. Those five bodies form the structure of the soul. And when a seeker has accomplished the completion of those five major mysteries, the seeker is given a choice of which path to follow next. Very few choose the straight path. The path of the Bodhisattva is perfectly demonstrated in the life of Jesus of Nazareth. Many think that his life was merely circumstantial, perhaps beautiful. But in truth, his life is a great teaching. 
this master, Jesus, came in order to demonstrate in action what has always been rendered only in the internal worlds. This cosmic drama of Christification or initiation. To become Christified is to incarnate or embody the sacred force and intelligence of the Christ. This intelligence is a vast, all-penetrating, incomprehensible fire, which is a kind of wisdom and intelligence which is beyond the capacity of our intellect to grasp. To really understand what Christ is, one has to incarnate that, to become one with that. And this is how one understands. The book of Revelation is a book which explains how to accomplish that. And what are the stages of that process? How to incorporate and incarnate that sacred, sublime force of sacrifice? The Christ, the Christos, is a cosmic energy. It is not an individual. And this energy, or this intelligence, has as its very nature love, compassion. So the path of the Bodhisattva is the path of one who seeks to become perfect love, to become the embodiment of perfected compassion. And this is only possible when that initiate, that seeker, removes from himself or herself everything that is selfish, everything that has to do with the I, with me, myself. That compassion, that love of the Christ, is universal and does not discriminate. It is not, does not show favoritism. It doesn't favor one group of people over another, or one race, or one ideology. It is a universal, all-encompassing love. But that love can only incarnate in the one who is prepared to receive it. The development of the solar bodies, which is the same process as the five major initiations, is the the process to create a vessel which can harness and focus and handle that sacred divine energy. Without solar bodies, no one can incarnate that Christic force. It's impossible. Any person without those solar vehicles would be disintegrated if that Christic force tried to enter into them. The solar bodies are a vessel or a vehicle, like a light bulb, which receives and modifies that energy. Now, we say modifies in a very particular way, which will become clear in the course of this lecture. A light bulb has certain characteristics, and yet it is the transmitter of an energy which is vast and very powerful. The light bulb receives and transmits that light by receiving that electric force and modifying it according to the nature of the bulb. The bodhisattva is the same. A bodhisattva, or a walker of the straight path, also receives that Christic fire, the universal, impersonal energy of the cosmic Christ. But that bodhisattva transmits that light according to their own idiosyncrasy, according to their own comprehension, their own nature. The process to arrive at the perfection of that transmission is very difficult. In comparison with the initiations of major mysteries, those become a matter of uh, sort of child's play compared with what the bodhisattva has to accomplish. As surprising as it may sound, there are innumerable Buddhas who exist in all the heavens, who have great perfection, who have many virtues, but who do not have the Christ, who do not have that force incarnated in them. So even though they are Buddhas of varying levels, And even though they may do some service on the behalf of humanity, they do not have the Christ. 
This demonstrates to us that there are different qualities of being and different qualities of teachings. A Buddha, for example, who incarnates into a human soul, his own human soul, to give his teachings on the face of this earth or any given planet, will give his teachings according to his level. He'll give teachings according to his path. Without the Christ within, he gives his teachings according to the spiral path, or the path of the pratyekas. And that teaching is good. And that will teach wisdom and love and compassion. And how to work on the mind. And how to increase the qualities of the soul and gain powers and understanding. But that teaching will not contain that potent force of Christic intelligence. The Buddha, who is a walker of the straight path, will incarnate in his human soul. And the teachings of that human soul will be very different. The terms may be similar. The nature of the teaching may appear to be the same. But the vital driving force will be that Christic intelligence, which will mark that teaching as different, as distinct. To arrive at that distinction, the human soul, of course, has to walk the straight path. And this path has very particular requirements, which are laid out in the sixth chapter and further of the book of Revelation. Now, we understand that the book of Revelation has many levels of meaning. It applies to the process of the individual as they work on themselves to walk the path. It also applies to humanity as a whole. So in this lecture, and in, of course all the lectures we've been giving, we're focusing on how the book of Revelation applies to our own personal work. To know more about how the book applies to humanity and the times that are coming, we advise you to read the book, The Aquarian Message. And you'll also find information about that aspect of the book of Revelation in many other books by Samael and Lior. But in the course of this lecture, we're concerned primarily with our own development. If we have sufficient discipline and sufficient willingness and sincerity to accomplish the initiations of major mysteries, or in other words, the serpents of fire. And if we have performed sacrifice for humanity, because this is the second requirement, we may be given access, the option, to enter into the straight path. The one who does so receives a very special form of initiation, which is called the initiation of Tipperet. And Tipperet, of course, is the fifth sphere on the tree of life. One, two, three, four, five. The sphere of Tipperet is related with the human soul and of course is the abstract mind, the intuitive mind. This abstract mind or intuitive mind is a mind which in some sense does not think. It is a mind that's connected with the wisdom of the being and so understands things with a superior form of reasoning, a superior kind of intelligence to the intellect that we know. <clears throat> the initiate who receives this initiation, the initiation of Tipperet, receives in their own selves, in themselves, the birth of their own particular Christ. This Christic force, which is universal, becomes humanized. That energy, or that intelligence, enters into their pineal gland and is born within the stable of their own mind. This, of course, is symbolized in the Christian mythology, in the Christian Gospels. When we see the images around Christmas time of the baby in the manger being watched by his parents and all the animals, that image is a symbol of the sacred process of the beginning of the work of the Bodhisattva. When the Christ, as a, as a baby, as an infant, 
is born within the psyche of that bodhisattva. And that Christ, being born as a baby, is very small and very weak and is surrounded by animals. The animals are the egos, the aggregates, the defects that we all carry within. The animals are our anger, our pride, our envy, our fear, resentment, self-love, self-hate. All of the qualities that characterize our own animal mind. This birth is a tremendous event. And it happens rarely because very few take this path. In the book of Revelation, we read about the lamb opening the first seal. This first seal is related with this birth, the birth of Jesus or the birth of the Savior. Jesus is a derivative of Yeshua, which means Savior. And our own particular Jesus Christ, or Savior, fire, is born within us when we take this path of the Bodhisattva. And this is equivalent to the opening of the first seal. That first seal is also called the Serpent of Light. So in the first group of initiations of major mysteries, we have Serpents of Fire. The Serpents of Fire are the processes by which the fires of the Holy Spirit rise in the spinal column of each one of our internal bodies. At the same time, we create, rather the Holy Spirit and the intelligence of our being, create the solar bodies, the solar astral, the solar mental, and the solar causal bodies. This process is a form of birth, where the vehicle is being formed, when the initiate chooses the straight path, this process of birth continues. Firstly, with this first seal, the beginning of the first serpent of light, when, the, when our own particularized, individualized Christ is born within. And this first serpent of light is related with the physical body, with Malkut, the first sphere at the base of the tree of life. The serpent of light is again another process of raising energy in the spinal column. But this is Christic light. And this is a work performed by the Christ within our psyche, in conjunction with our own work. Truly, we cannot save ourselves. The mind that we've elaborated is so dense, so heavy, so complicated, there's no time, there's no chance, there's no possibility for us to do it on our own. The walkers of the spiral path fall repeatedly, the human soul, because the ego is so dense and difficult. While the Buddha of the spiral path remains in nirvana, their human soul incarnates again and again and falls again and again because the lust, the pride, and the anger is so heavy. The walker of the straight path attempts to accomplish the work in one life, maybe a little more. And this is a very difficult task. But it's impossible to do it alone. The walker of the straight path can only accomplish it because of the intervention of the Christ. The Christ is that way, that light, which illuminates the path and the Bodhisattva follows the guidance of the Christ in the process of eliminating all of the undesirable elements that we have within. This first serpent of light related to the physical body is the process by which the physical serpent, or the serpent related to Malkut, raises up the spinal column. This is a further degree of development of the sphere of Malkut and brings with it its own natural benefits. 
This is symbolized in the book of Genesis, in this first section of book 6, or chapter 6. And we see in this section, or this chapter, uh, the symbol of a white horse. A white horse symbolizes the physical body. So, generally speaking, if we dream of a white horse, we can be pretty sure that it's going to be related to the physical body, the nature of that dream. We see in this chapter that it says, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were the noise of thunder, one of the four living creatures saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. So in the artwork that we have on the website, we see the initiate seated in meditation with the fires of Yasad burning. And we see the bow, which is the relationship of the sexual energy and the heart directed towards the mind. This is, of course, related with the process of the serpent of light raising up the spinal column. The bow is the divine light rainbow of the heart. And the intelligence which guides this development is, of course, the Christ himself, who is particularized within the, the initiate. Of course, the job here is that the initiate with the guidance and assistance of the Christ, has to conquer their own mind, has to conquer particular psychological aspects related to the sphere of Malkut. In the appearance of the Christ within the stable, when that process unfolds and the Christ is born within the human being, three kings appear come to visit, which we see symbolized as well in the artwork. The three kings always worship the Lord. These three kings in Hebrew are called Malachim. And the Malachim are three walkers of the straight path. The Malachim always worship the Christ, the Lord. The walkers of the spiral path, the pratyekas and shravakas, do not. Only the bodhisattvas can recognize the Christ. What this means is that only the bodhisattvas understand the bodhisattvas. The walkers of the spiral path do not understand the bodhisattvas. This is why we see teachers such as Krishna or Jesus, or Muhammad, are very controversial. When they teach in their times, they are hated, persecuted, and rejected by the religious authorities. This is because the walkers of the spiral path, who generally become spiritual authorities of one kind or another, do not understand the bodhisattvas, because they don't walk the path of the bodhisattva. So the religious authorities generally reject violently the teachings of the Christ. And this happens in all times and all ages. It also happens within the initiate. The initiate is faced with having to follow the instruction of the Christ, who is revolutionary. But those instructions often go against our own background, our own upbringing, our own tradition, our own understanding. And to follow the direction and guidance of the Christ becomes very difficult. When our own inner Herod, the king who seeks to kill the Savior, is rejecting the guidance that the Christ is offering. But the Malachim, these three kings, always recognize the Lord because they also have the Lord within. The first king is black. This is a symbol of the walker of the straight path who still has the ego alive. 
He's black with the lead of the personality, with the darkness of his own animal mind. The Christ is within him. The black king has entered into the path, but the ego is alive in him. So he's a beginner. The white king is the king who has cleaned himself of the ego or is in that process, meaning that he's someone who's walking the second mountain. And the yellow king is someone who's resurrected. The ego is completely dead, and they have incarnated the totality of their being, and they're working in the third mountain. These three mountains are the fundamental symbol of the path of the bodhisattva. The first mountain is the mountain of birth, which, whose first half is the serpents of fire and whose second half is the serpents of light. The second mountain is the mountain of the resurrection, within which the initiate has to work through all the twelve labors of Hercules, or the first labors of Hercules, in order to disintegrate the ego. And in the third mountain of ascension, the initiate has to incarnate the Logos. At the end of the second mountain, the initiate becomes resurrected. So these three mountains are only walked by the walkers of the straight path, the bodhisattvas. The nirvanis never leave the first mountain unless they take the straight path. So these three kings representing walkers of the straight path, always worship the Lord. And naturally, the birth of the Christ is threatened by the king, Herod. Herod wants all the firstborn children in the land to be killed in order to protect his own power. His greed and pride is so great that he was willing to sacrifice all these children right in the story. Herod, of course, is a symbol of our own mind, our own pride, our own attachment. And in the initiate, the walker of the straight path, these egos have to be dealt with. Like anyone with ego, even the bodhisattva with ego alive, the black king, still has pride, still has attachment, still has cravings for power for glory, to be a king like Herod. But for a black king to become a white king, all of that desire has to die. In the second serpent of light, the Christ works to raise his vital force in the sphere of Yasod is related to our own vital body or etheric body. And we see in the artwork the initiate seated in meditation. And we see a horse which in the chapter is red. The chapter says, and when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, come and see. And there went out another horse that was red And power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. This second serpent is related to the symbol in the life of Jesus of the baptism. When John, the baptizer, baptizes Jesus in the river, the waters of Yasod. This red horse, of course, is related to the vital body or etheric body. And red is naturally related with fire, with that solar light. But we see in this chapter that he that sits upon the horse, who of course is the Christ, has power to take peace from the earth. This is related to 
the earth, of course, is related to our physical body. And when we abuse the energies of the vital body, then we create disequilibrium in the physical body. Now, the vital body is made up of four ethers, or four aspects. And these aspects are related to metabolism and the processes of digestion, which, of course, is the ether of, um, the what is it? ether of the chemical ether. And then we have the ether of life, which is related to reproduction. These are the two lower aspects of the vital body. The two superior aspects are the luminous and reflecting. These two are related to, firstly, our senses and perception, how we perceive through our senses. And secondly, to memory, imagination, and willpower. When we abuse of our memory, of our imagination, of our willpower, when we abuse the functions of the body in terms of our digestion and reproduction, we create disequilibrium. We create suffering for ourselves. In the process of the second serpent of light, the initiate is having to correct many such mistakes to establish equilibrium in the vital body, in the use of energies, in order to not be subject to so much karma. The great sword is that sexual force itself, which is used in order, in the right way, to correct the disequilibrium in order to work properly with the energies of the vital body and raise the serpent of light. Now this serpent, the second seal, is related with baptism. And baptism is a symbol of the transmutation of the sexual waters. This is indicating to us that these waters need to be properly recycled, properly utilized, The second seal, or the second serpent of light, is related to the Christification of this vital body, where this body reaches a higher degree of development and is able to transmit and transform more potent forms of energy. This second seal is also related to the temptations that Jesus faced in the wilderness, immediately following the baptism. If you recall the story, after being baptized in the river, Jesus goes out into the wilderness alone to fast, to meditate, to pray. And in that 40 days, he is tempted by the devil. That devil, of course, is his own Lucifer, his own psychological trainer, or that Christic intelligence which is trapped within the abyss That temptation, or the temptations that Lucifer presents, have three forms. In the first, he says, if you're so hungry, fasting in the wilderness, and you're such a great initiate, all you have to do is command these stones, and they will turn into bread, and then you can eat. And of course, Jesus in the story says, man does not live by bread alone. But the meaning here is that manas, man, the superior manas, or tiparep, does not live by bread of wisdom, by meditation alone. One must incarnate the Lord. The development of tiparep does not happen without the presence of the Christ. This is a teaching pointing towards all the Buddhas, Pratyekas, and Shravakas who believe that in the path of the spiral they can reach the perfect development of the mind, of manas, tiparet. But it's mistaken. The perfection of our own abstract mind or inner mind 
can only occur when the cosmic Christ incarnates within that mind to cleanse it of all of the egos. So here in this gospel, Jesus is giving that teaching. In the second temptation, the devil, or Lucifer, says, takes him to the pinnacle of the temple. I mean, he takes him and shows him all the kingdoms of the earth, right? And says, if you worship me, you can have power over all of these kingdoms. And, of course, Jesus rejects this and says, we must only worship the Lord. This is also a teaching for the Pratyeka Buddhas and the Shravakas, who become very attached to their kingdoms, to their powers, to nirvana. And Jesus, in this story, is saying, you should only worship the one master, who is the Christ. You should never be attached to powers, to having a kingdom, which the Buddhas have, to having powers, to having virtues, to having gifts. One should only worship the Lord. And in the third temptation, Lucifer takes him to the pinnacle of the temple and says, if you're such a great initiate, throw yourself from this great height and the angels will lift you up. And of course, Jesus says, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. This is saying to the Buddha's Pratyekas and Shravakas, do not abuse your powers. Do not tempt the Lord by using powers out of pride to demonstrate yourself, to show yourself to others. The initiate who's working in the second serpent of light is working against and working on egos related to these temptations. Among many other things. But these teachings indicate and point out how the walker of the straight path differs from the walker of the spiral. In the third serpent of light related to the third seal, we read in the book of Revelation, and when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. Now, of course, in the third serpent, we're discussing the world of Hod on the tree of life. And Hod is related with the astral world. It is also related with the Tattva, Tehas, or fire. The black horse is related to the astral body. But in particular, what we're looking at here is the lunar astral body, which is black with ego. This is the body of desire. The chapter says, And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see that thou hurt not the oil and the wine. In synthesis, we see that this chapter is pointing out that we have to differentiate and discriminate in ourselves and choose between following that Christic guidance, which demands the renunciation of desire, or we remain identified with desire. This is the choice that we have. In this seal, the third seal, the third serpent, this is related with the transfiguration of the Christ, in which Jesus, in his story, appears before a couple of the disciples, alongside Moses and Elias. Now, in the Gospels, we read that previous to the transfiguration, Jesus kept himself hidden. He kept himself in secret. And he didn't want his disciples to reveal anything about him to anyone. But when the transfiguration occurs, and the disciples see him with Moses and Elias, afterward, 
Jesus reveals himself. He begins to reveal his mission. And the same is true of the Bodhisattva who is accomplishing the third serpent of light. The transfiguration of the Lord is occurring within that Bodhisattva. So that process of defining himself or herself against the lunar animal passions of the lunar astral body is the process in which the Christ is being transfigured. The solar astral body, which is created in the first uh, half of the first mountain, in the third serpent of fire, of major mysteries, that is the first creation of the Christ within us, the solar astral body. In a sense, you can say that is the first coming. But in the third serpent of light, which is in the second half of the first mountain, that solar astral body is perfected. This is an important distinction. To understand that in the serpents of fire, the initiate creates the solar bodies. In the serpents of light, the initiate perfects the solar bodies. This is related to some teachings in the ancient alchemical tradition, where you see that first you create the gold, and then you perfect it. This is indicating the difference between the serpents of fire and the serpents of light. And again, we emphasize, Buddhas who are on the straight path perfect the solar bodies. Buddhas who are on the spiral path do not. So there's a vast distinction between the structure of the soul itself, between these two different walkers. This third serpent, being related to the tattva of fire, or tehas, is, of course, the sulfur of alchemy. And that fire is the fundamental basis through which the transformation occurs in us. The fire is what perfects the bodies. The fire is the heat of the furnace. And in this process of the third seal, related to this third serpent, we see that the book says, Come and see, and I beheld, and lo, a black horse. Come and see is an indication to look at the desires we have within. For the initiate, the bodhisattva, to, to recognize that the lunar astral body is still there. When one creates the solar astral body, one just creates a new vessel. But the lunar astral body, or the animal aspect, still exists. And this is the ego itself. This is, in its fundamental basis, what we call a Hannes Moose. Or an entity who has a double center of gravity. This is a black king, a Malachim. A Hannes Moose has the solar bodies created and has the ego alive. So there is a double center of gravity. There is a form of mastery, a level of mastery in the consciousness. But there's also a level of demonic intelligence. So that initiate is split. And this is the great danger that every walker faces in these times on, on the straight or the spiral path. And by seeing this distinction, we can understand why in past times these teachings of alchemy were hidden. Previously, previous to this current age, which we just entered, initiates were required to eliminate a large portion of ego before they were given these teachings of alchemy. And this is quite evident when you study the levels of tantric Buddhism. If you look at how Tibetan Buddhism structures the teachings, <clears throat> you see what they call the Tripitaka, the three baskets. And this is, firstly, the, the lesser vehicle or the introductory vehicle. <clears throat> Some call it Hinayana. It's also called Shravakayana, which is that 
first set of introductory teachings, or exoteric, we would say, which are concerned with understanding the ego, working on the mind, learning how to meditate, learning how to be aware and observe oneself. This is a fundamental requirement that all students have to learn. And in previous times, they had to demonstrate with works a certain degree of development in the elimination of the ego by learning to meditate and observe oneself. With development, with practice, with proofs, the student could be introduced into more advanced aspects of the teaching, which then you get into the second basket called Mahayana, or the greater vehicle. And in this case, the practitioner is introduced to compassion, to working on behalf of others, the first stages of understanding what it means to be bodhisattva. And in this case, they also begin to comprehend and meditate on the nature of emptiness. The reason here is that in order to go deeper in the elimination of the ego, one has to understand what that is. What is the inherent nature of all things? And that is the teachings of shunyata, or emptiness. The initiate, or the practitioner, who develops in that capacity of comprehending emptiness in practice and continuing to eliminate ego, can then be entered into tantrayana, or vajrayana, which is the third basket. The first two are related to the sutras, right, the exoteric teachings, and the third is related to the tantras, which are esoteric. It, within tantrism, depending on which school of Tibetan Buddhism you look at, there may be four or six levels. And again, the practitioner has to prove by mastering, by developing skill in each level of the teaching before they reach the highest, which is highest yoga tantra, which is alchemy, which is the work with a consort. In Tibetan Buddhism, this is called karma mudra, which is action seal. And that is the actual practice of working with a partner, male and female, working together. So you can see there are enormous requirements, and every level of which requires practical, direct experience in meditation before reaching the highest aspect, which is tantrism. Why? The reason is, unless one works very hard to awaken consciousness and eliminate ego, one is in danger of becoming a Hanas Mus, a double center of gravity, if you enter into alchemy too quickly. This was the rationale in those times, in past ages. And this is important. Times have changed. Nowadays, there's no time. Now, the judges of the law have opened the doors and said to humanity, here's the teaching. If you want it, take it. Now is your opportunity. There's no more time to wait for a student to develop slowly through each level of that form of teaching. There's no more time. Now it is necessary for a revolution to happen within us. And that's why these gates have been opened, even with the danger of becoming a split personality. The teachings of tantrism, the teachings of alchemy, are in fact that double-edged sword. That sword, if used improperly, can hurt, can damage oneself. And this is unfortunately very common because the ego is so heavy. It requires an enormous amount of caution, of self-awareness, and sincerity to use the sword properly, to use the sexual force in the right way. It's essential that we work with it. That sword, the alchemical knowledge of how to use the waters of Yasad, bears with it a great responsibility but it is the only way we can make progress against our own mind. That mind that we have is so dense, so strong, so heavy, 
It requires divine intervention. The intelligence of the Christ to guide us. But that intelligence can only incarnate within us once we've created the solar bodies. So in order to create the solar bodies, we have to have alchemy. We have to have tantra. That's why the doors are open. Even though there's great danger, the doors are open, the path is revealed, and those who want it can achieve it. And those who want to remain in foolishness will remain in foolishness. So this third serpent of light is particularly focused on the body of desire, the lunar astral body. The initiate has to make distinctions within themselves between divine aspects of the being, virtues of the being related to the astral body, and tenebrous aspects or infernal aspects related to the lunar astral body. Truthfully, with each seal, with each serpent of light, the bodhisattva is receiving this guidance of the Christ and is unveiling or revealing higher and higher degrees of the being or virtues of the being. And these virtues or, or capacities are transmitted through each of these bodies. So there are particular virtues or capacities of the being related to the physical body, which can only be activated when the serpent of light is arisen. Likewise with the etheric vital body or in the astral body. This third serpent, as we said, is related to the transfiguration. And when Jesus appears in the transfiguration, he appears between Moses and Elias. Moses, of course, is related to the waters. Remember the story of Moses being put on the basket and drifting in the stream. Moses is a symbol of our own inner willpower. And he's the one who receives and transmits the doctrine of the law. So Moses represents a certain part of our own consciousness, a certain aspect of ourselves. Elias is also a prophet who has tremendous energy, great zeal, great force to explain, to point out, to indicate the teaching. And we see also, of course, Jesus in this trinity. The transfiguration as a whole symbolizes the moment in which the Christ is revealed. And with Moses and Elias, we see the capacity to transmit and understand the doctrine of the Christ. Elias, Moses, and Jesus, three great teachers, three great transmitters of the teaching. It's in this process of the serpent of light that the bodhisattva begins to truly comprehend and transmit that sacred doctrine, the Christic doctrine, in accordance with their own idiosyncrasy. We see in, for example, the teachings of Krishna, the doctrine of the Christ, but expressed according to a particular point of view, expressed through the idiosyncrasy of Krishna, the initiate. We see the doctrine of Moses. Beautiful, beautiful teaching. The same knowledge, but expressed according to the idiosyncrasy of Moses. We see Moses' teachings embodied in certain books and transmitted in this way with a certain flavor and a certain emphasis. In the teachings of Jesus, the great master, we also have those Christic laws, the Christic teaching, the path, revealed in a certain way, according to a certain point of view. The same teaching, it's the same understanding, but from a different idiosyncrasy. So we understand then that the Bodhisattva is receiving that capacity in this transfiguration related to the third serpent of light. And of course, all of this is under the guidance of the Christ, that intelligence. 
in the fourth seal, the fourth serpent of light, we read, And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. Now, of course, reading that, we become afraid. <laughs> uh, and, of course, we always think about the times to come and Armageddon and all the difficulties and pain that humanity is facing. But in the context of our own work, the process of this straight path, if we are so focused and so fortunate to enter into that path, we then understand that this fourth serpent of light, or this section of the book of Revelation, is related to that fourth serpent and is related to our own mind. The fourth seal, of course, is related with the air and is related with Netzach on the tree of life. This is related with the inferior mind or inferior manas, which is the concrete mind. And it's related with the lunar mental body. So the initiate who's working in this third seal is working again to clarify to differentiate between the lunar and solar aspects of the mind. Symbolically, this is represented in the gospel when the master Jesus tells his disciples to fetch for him an ass and a colt. After the transfiguration, he's going to enter into Jerusalem. Jerusalem, of course, is psychological. It's related with our own mind, related specifically with the pineal gland. And when we read in the book of Matthew, we see Jesus says, Go into the village, and straight away you shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them unto me. And then, of course, Jesus rides into Jerusalem and is received with festivities. But what does he do when he arrives there? He goes to the temple. And when he arrives in the temple, he begins to whip and cast out the merchants. Once again, we see how the symbolism of the gospel, the stories of his life, really relate to the psychological processes that we have to pass through. Jesus, or Yeshua, the Savior within, the Christ who is working to save the walker of the straight path, has to gain control over the inferior manas, the lunar, the lunar mental body. And we know in Gnosis that there are actually three types of mind. There is the sensual mind, which is that aspect of mind which only believes what it can perceive through the five senses. And this type of mind, of course, is very concrete, very materialistic, very dense. Then we have the second type of mind, which is the intermediate mind. And this is the type of mind that only believes in its beliefs. It only follows traditions. It has certain moral codes that it adheres itself to. And it is a fanatical mind. So these two lower forms of mind are related with the Pharisees and Sadducees who appear constantly in the Gospels. The Pharisee is a symbol of the intermediate mind, the fanatic believer. And the Sadducee is a symbol of the sensual mind, the one who only believes what he can perceive with his five physical senses. Of course, Jesus is always correcting them and infuriating them. And the same is occurring within the psyche of the initiate. The sensual mind and the intermediate mind are these two creatures that Jesus asks to be brought to him. 
The ass is the sensual mind. And the cult is the intermediate mind. And Jesus, in this case, represents the third type of mind, which is the inner mind, or the abstract mind. This is the mind of the consciousness, the mind of the being, the mind of intuition. And in the Bodhisattva, this is the vehicle that the Christ uses in order to guide the initiate. But in this third or fourth seal, the Christ born within us has to gain dominance over the sensual and intermediate minds. That is, within the initiate, the sensual mind has to be brought into control, and the intermediate mind as well. Which means that we have to, as the walker, conquer our own inner Pharisee. We have to control our own inner Pharisee. The inner Pharisee is our own inner fanatic, our own believer, who believes but does not see, who believes but does not know, who follows moral codes, beliefs, traditions. In the Gospel, we see that Jesus points out to the Pharisees, calls them hypocrites, and says, you are the ones who hold the keys but neither go in yourselves or let anyone else go in. That inner Pharisee is within all of us. And that is the one who is selfish, who takes the teachings for oneself, who does not have compassion. The Pharisee, in a crude sense, is really representing our own inner fanatic. And it's this part of us that's very self-focused and self-concerned, which is a large part of our own mind. The Christ has to dominate that in order for us to make progress. But in particular, the bodhisattva who's walking the straight path has to comprehend very well the nature of the sensual and intermediate minds and has to open the inner mind the Christ mind. Jesus goes into the temple in order to cast out the merchants. The merchants are the merchants of souls. These are those people who make business with spirituality, who make business with the souls of men, who charge money for spiritual teachings. The inner Christ casts out these merchants. So within the initiate, within the walker, there will be certain egos, certain aspects of the mind that want to make business or get something out of it egotistically. It doesn't necessarily mean that the initiate is trying to make physical money from the teaching that they study. It may be that they have egos that want to gain benefit by being in the teachings. Egos that want an exchange to build themselves, such as pride. The inner Christ has to cleanse the temple of that plague. But of course, we see meaning here as well in the physical world. There are many merchants in the temple. Many who do business with the souls of men. Many who charge money for things that should rightfully be freely given. And these things are crimes against the Christ and against humanity. And these merchants always justify themselves. But they're wrong. In synthesis, we say that this fourth seal is the process in which the inner Christ dominates the lower aspects of the mind. When the inner mind opens to a greater degree and the initiate is able to receive clearer and more direct instruction. The sensual mind and the intermediate mind are more controlled under the guidance of the Christ. 
So these are the first four serpents of light. And we're going to investigate the remaining serpents of light in next week's lecture. Are there any questions? Yes. Okay, sure. The question is to define the term bodhisattva. The Sanskrit meaning is it's a compound word. So bodhi in Sanskrit is wisdom. And sattva means the essence of or embodiment of. So bodhisattva would be the essence of wisdom. What's interesting about that, just in the etymology is that we know that a bodhisattva, in terms of uh, the Asian teachings, is an incarnation of compassion, right? Is the carrier of that compassionate force. So in the East, they call that Avalokiteshvara, or Chinresik. In Kabbalah, it's the Christ, right? The bodhisattva incarnates the Christ, which in Hebrew is Chokmah, which means wisdom. So you see a very close relationship when you analyze the etymology of the term. But the meaning of the bodhisattva, a bodhisattva is a vehicle, a vessel, like a light bulb. And in this case, we say it is the solar bodies, properly built, properly perfected through the serpents of light, which transmit that Christic intelligence, the light of the Christ. So once perfected, it becomes one with that Christ, that compassionate force. So we see there are many levels of bodhisattvas, and those are those three kings. Uh, a bodhisattva, properly speaking, is a perfect vehicle of the Christic intelligence. And examples of a bodhisattva would be Krishna, Moses, Jesus, Katsalkwadal, um, Padmasambhava, um, Kuan Yin, Fuji, teachers of that caliber. These are properly developed bodhisattvas. There are many who aspire to that path, but few who enter into it. Would you use the term avatar? An avatar is a, is a specific type of bodhisattva. Um, in Gnosis, we understand that an avatar is a messenger related to a particular age. So in, in Eastern etymology, the term avatar is used a little more loosely. So you have, for example, the ten avatars of um, Vishnu. And that's actually more of like a proper use of the term avatar. Because each one of those incarnations of Vishnu, who incidentally is also Chokmah, appear within certain ages in order to give their teachings. But in Hinduism and sometimes in Buddhism as well, they use the term avatar a little more loosely as a very highly developed initiate. Um, the trick with understanding the bodhisattva it's hard to put it in terms. There's a kind of flavor, there's a there's a certain characteristic. And I think in, in synthesis, you know, a lot of writers on occultism have struggled to sort of express that. What is the difference? You know, what is, what is it that makes the bodhisattva distinct? Christ. It's Christ, really. But to explain that to the mind is not simple. You know, there are many Buddhas who do great works, but they're not bodhisattvas. So to differentiate is, the best way to understand it is to really understand what Christ is. And Christ is sacrifice, pure sacrifice. 
So the bodhisattva becomes the embodiment of that. And when we study the bodhisattva ideal, we're really studying how to completely and fully abandon the sense of I and to focus entirely on benefiting others. So that's the ideal. But to accomplish it means that the ego, the mind, has to be completely eradicated. And that can only be accomplished by the Christ. Hmm? What is taking its place? The Christ itself. That's part of the difficulty. The Christ is universal. It is a cosmic intelligence, which means it has no individuality. So in meditation or in certain kinds of experiences, you may experience that sense of being one with everything and everyone. And that is Christic. That is the nature of that Christ. But Christ becomes individualized within the bodhisattva. So in last week's lecture, the example was given of all the light bulbs in the world, right? How each light bulb receives that electricity. And the electricity is universal. It's an energy that's in many things. But when it's focused and directed, it's transmitted through that one bulb. And so it becomes individualized. And that's what happens in a bodhisattva. That Christic intelligence becomes individualized. But within that light itself is all the light. In a sense, you can say that. Personal expression of the impersonal. Yeah. In, the, in, in its root, all religions are the same thing. Because all religions express a science which comes from one source. But as that religion is expressed, it becomes particularized or becomes idiosyncratic according to the transmitter, the psychology of the teacher according to the times in which it's taught, according to the people who receive that tradition and begin to change it. Eventually, the light may disappear from it completely and only the shell remains. That's, that's happened. But the light itself is the driving force that really gives it life. And the same is true of the Bodhisattva. Any other questions? So the seven seals are all serpents of fire? No, the seven seals are serpents of light. The serpents of fire are the process to create the soul, and the serpents of light, or the seven seals, are the process to perfect those solar bodies. Remember, in last week's lecture, previous lectures we've discussed, the seven seals are seals that have to be opened, and those seals are opened by the Lamb, who is the Christ. But for the Lamb to open those seals... First, we have to make the book, and the book is the soul itself, the solar bodies. So in the processes of fire, we create that book. We create those seven vessels. And then the serpents of light, the seals are opened, which means that those vessels are perfected. The reason this is important is because once those vessels are perfected through the serpents of light, we pass through certain types of ordeals, and then we try to gain entrance into the second mountain. The second mountain is where the initiate really begins to work on the ego. The first mountain is about birth. The first mountain, this first aspect of the path, is about creating the soul and perfecting that vehicle. Because that vehicle, the Merkaba, that chariot, is what the initiate needs in order to descend into the abyss to, to eliminate all of the ego. And it cannot be done unless the chariot is created. So in the Mahabharata, that great war within, we need that vehicle, the chariot. Arjuna, the human soul, is there with Krishna, the Christ. And the chariot that they use to go to war is the soul itself. And the chariot is gold, right? That gold is the gold of the solar bodies, the golden solar body of the solar man which is created in the mysteries of fire, perfected in the mysteries of light, and then sent to battle in the second mountain. Another question? 
This has to do with the elimination of the lunar body. Samai Lombard mentions meditating in the different worlds. If we are in the astral and we can remember to do so, will doing the practices in the lunar body help? Of course. Any meditation you can do in any sphere will be greatly helpful in your process. But to destroy the lunar astral body comes much later. You can comprehend egos and eliminate them any time you meditate in any sphere. Yes. In the past, how much of the ego did disciples have to annihilate in order to receive the key of the great arcanum? Well, I think that's probably dependent upon which school, which teaching, which teacher, and which time. There's a, I'm sure there's a great variance, and I don't have a specific detailed answer. But what I can tell you is this. The disciple would have to be awake. That is, the disciple would have to have awakened consciousness to not be asleep like we are. So how awake? I don't know. Probably depends on the, the times and the demands of that teacher. But the disciple would have to be awake to a percentage. Meaning, having the capacity to comprehend with the consciousness without the interference of the ego. Anything else? Yes. Uh, you talked about the, the path of John mm. being a path of the Buddhist dharma. Could you elaborate on that and how that's spoken of in Christianity? Book of Revelation. The path of John. John wrote the book, right? Yeah. John is the initiate. Iohannes, right? John. Johannes. And like all the disciples, all the apostles, John represents a certain aspect of our own consciousness. But in this book in particular, John represents the initiate who's trying to advance in the process of the Bodhisattva. And the Christ, particularized within John, is giving him this teaching of the book of Revelation. There's a chapter about the path of John in the book, The Doomed Aryan Race. So there's a little bit more about that. Do you have a question too? Yeah, how do you reconcile um, Buddhist terminology of, you know, speaking of void or emptiness mm -hmm. with uh, maybe a more Western uh, expression of God being everywhere, everything, being no place without it? Well, according to my understanding, in Christian theology, um, I've not seen a term or a particular teaching that indicates emptiness in a direct way. But if you look in the book of Genesis, you see in the very beginning that all was void. Right? That is emptiness. Shunyata. In the, of course. It's the root of all existence is emptiness. But it is not non-existence. Um, in Kabbalah, that is the Ain, right? The Ain. Well, it's not really. I mean, absolutely, uh, it's not truly empty. Of course. And if you, if you really analyze Buddhism, you see the same thing. When, unfortunately, I think when Buddhism has been transmitted to the West, a lot of the terminology has been misunderstood. So if you study, for example, the Heart Sutra, which is the great teaching on emptiness from the Buddhist tradition, that sutra is all about how it is form but not form. It is matter, but it is not matter. Right? It is something, but it is nothing. And that is the nature of the void. It is potentiality, according to Kabbalah. So when we study emptiness, we have to understand Really what the teachings on emptiness are pointing out is interdependence. When you study Mahayana teachings, or you study this aspect of Kabbalah, of how to understand the absolute, what you're really looking at is how nothing exists in and of itself. Everything is dependent upon something else. And in Buddhism they call this dependent origination. That idea or that concept is trying to point us towards the comprehension of attachment, of dependence. Because the ego is dependent 
right? The ego that we have, the mind that we have, causes us to suffer because we ignore the fundamental truth of existence. That truth is emptiness itself, that things do not exist as we think, as we perceive. So when we can really experientially comprehend what emptiness is, what the absolute is, we realize I'm attached to nothing. My ego is based on nothing, on illusion. Could you say that that nothing is the same as saying, like, no thing? Yeah, that's what Zen is saying. It's the same exact teaching. The, the, the difficulty here is that the mind can't grasp it, right? The mind is always seeking an absolute in terms of absolute yes or absolute no. It either exists or it does not, right? But the absolute in itself is both. It is existence and non-existence. So it's not absolute? It is absolute. That is the nature of the absolute. And that's why the mind struggles. But in meditation, you can comprehend that. You can understand that intuitively and directly in meditation. And the, the beginning of that is when we meditate in our desires. We meditate in our attachments. We start to see, for example, when we're at work and we're having a hard time, maybe we're in trouble, and we feel a lot of worry or anxiety, and then the trouble goes away and we feel better. And then the trouble comes again and we feel bad. And we meditate in that we start to see, what is my suffering based on? Conditions which change. Conditions which are always impermanent, arising and passing. Why should I get so upset? And real comprehension of that particular ego disempowers that ego. And then when those situations come and go, we don't feel that. We feel at peace. In its level, that's a comprehension of emptiness. Because we've comprehended that that desire for security is baseless. It's based in something that doesn't exist, which is a permanent state. Right? There's nothing that's permanent except the absolute itself. So the mind will run in circles about this. And that's why meditation is so important. And we enter into that understanding through our own practical daily experience by comprehending desire. It's a subtle thing, but the comprehension of emptiness and shunyata is in the heart. Something that you feel, you say, ah, oh, I get it. You start to get that deeper and deeper. And eventually, that donkey of the mind, the sensual mind, which wants proof physically, and the intermediate mind, which wants to build a concept, you start to see that those two forms of mind will never get it. And then the inner mind starts to grasp. The inner mind is opening, which is that Christ mind. Does one have to first understand things on an uh, intellectual level before they can sure. uh, transcend? Sure. Uh, of course. It's, we need to understand things intellectually first. This is true. But we can't stop there. And we have to realize that the intellect has limitations. So the intellect may grasp a particular concept. But what you'll notice is, when you grasp a concept just with the intellect, the intellect will then say, but what if the opposite is true? And the intellect will say, oh, but then there's this, and start to enter into conflict, right? So the, what most people wind up doing is they take it into another aspect of the intermediate mind, which says, well, that's the way it is, because that's the way it is, which is also based on nothing. So to really comprehend, yeah, we have to first grasp it at the intellectual level, to see the structure. But we have to go really with meditation, with the consciousness, to comprehend something. So you're really taking everything as a symbol. Mm -hmm. And does it matter or, or not if, anything, if there's any uh, literal uh, history to any of this? Or it related to what specifically? Well, let's say in any, in any scripture, mm. West or the East. I mean, okay. The question is about how do we understand scripture and levels of meaning, whether literal or otherwise. 
Well, in Gnosis, we understand from the teaching that any scripture will have multiple levels of meaning. And generally, we say there are seven. Seven levels of meaning to any scripture. And of course, the first is literal. So when we study the Bible, there is a certain level of literal truth. We know that Moses was alive and that he had his life, which had a certain relationship with the story that's told in the Bible. But that's not the whole story, and it isn't detailed and accurate to the infinite degree. It's a little bit interpretive. It's a little bit symbolic. But there are six other levels of meaning there in his story, and the same in the Gospels. So any scripture will have literal truth and then other levels of meaning, which we, would, we will comprehend according to our level. So as you awaken consciousness and as you begin to comprehend things intuitively and consciously, more levels become revealed. For example, even studying Gnosis, we're studying something that's very rich, right? very potent and very direct, but even that has levels of meaning. You can read, for example, um, a book like Revolutionary Psychology which has a very direct, very clear implication when we study it. But as you study it more and practice and awaken consciousness, you see that there are other levels of meaning that you could not see before. Even though at the beginning it seems quite literal and direct. But the, the consciousness can perceive those additional meanings. And this is true to a great degree, probably beyond just seven levels of meaning. There are many meanings within the scripture. And the reason is, true scripture is the word of God. True scripture is a kind of intelligence put into a form that can deliver many levels of meaning and implication. The mind cannot grasp it. Only the consciousness can access that. And so this requires meditation, and it requires practical work. Pretty much any student of Gnosis that you talk to <clears throat> will agree. You can read a book once and get a certain amount. But if you read the book again, you'll wonder if you even read it the first time. And you read it a third time, and you wonder, did you even read it the first and second times? And this is true. You can read a book ten times, and still, I don't remember reading that. Did I read that before? You'll hear this many times. And what it indicates is the depth of that scripture and the difficulty that we have to grasp its knowledge consciously. It takes a great deal for that knowledge to penetrate our mind. So it takes patience and practice. Any other questions? Yes. Um, do walkers of the spiral path still practice alchemy? To even enter into the spiral path, you have to have created the solar bodies. And you can only create the solar bodies through tantrism, through alchemy. <clears throat> so, any initiate who has chosen to enter the spiral path is an initiate who's already reached the development of the solar causal body. So they've, walked, they've worked in alchemy for a certain period of time. However, they may not work with it anymore. They may not teach it. And as a human soul, as someone who's incarnated in a physical body, they may not even know about it. But in past times, they would have had to work with alchemy. So it depends on the idiosyncrasy of that person. Any other questions? Yes. Sure. Okay. The question is about the nature of the solar bodies and the difference, the use of the term. Well, when we examine any great religion, we always see a solar myth, which is some kind of um, drama related to the sun, right? And the sun is always related to the giver of life, to the source of existence. 
Apollo, for example, Osiris. And we see in Christianity the same symbol of Jesus, who is the light of the world. So when we talk about solar, we're discussing um, a superior aspect of nature, which is the, that force which gives life to the earth, right? It is literal and figurative. So it's literal in the sense that physical light is the lowest aspect of solar energy, which has many levels, right? Solar forces or solar energies are really the energies of the Christ itself. But there are many levels. So an initiate who's working in the straight path, for example, is working with superior aspects of solar light in different levels of the consciousness, according to the tree of life. The absolute itself irradiates a light, which is the Ein Sof Or, the ray of Akitanon, and that is solar light. But nonetheless, the point being, solar and lunar are two aspects of this axis that we look at. And in, you look in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna emphasizes this. He says there are two paths. There's a solar path and a lunar path. The solar path is walked by those on a superior ascending arch. And that is those who enter into the path to create the bodies, the solar bodies, and to ascend in their development of a consciousness. And then there's the lunar path, which is the path of smoke, the path of darkness. And that's walked by all those who remain on the wheel of samsara without solar bodies and without positive conscious works to uh, elevate their own soul. Lunar, in this sense, is related to a descending arch, and solar is related to an ascending arch. So really, solar and lunar uh, terminology is symbolic of sort of a, a direction and a root of that force, a root of energy. So we also would say that solar is related to the father, or you know, to God. Lunar is related to the mother, to feminine forces. So we also use solar and lunar in that sense as uh, polarities, which in that case, lunar is not negative. It's not wrong. It's not bad or entering into suffering. It's just related to the moon. So this is where it can get a little fuzzy sometimes. Um, for example, humanity is lunar because humanity has not created the vehicles for the Christ to enter into in us, meaning the solar bodies. We have lunar bodies, which are the, ve the vehicles that we inhabit now, which have been created by nature, Mother Nature, who is lunar, right? related to the moon, to Selene, and to the mechanical processes of nature. As such, we are a lunar humanity, meaning that we've been given bodies by the lunar forces or the feminine forces of nature, which will then return to nature. They don't belong to our being. Solar body belongs to the being, and no one can take that away. So we have to become a solar humanity to create vessels that the sun, the Christ, can enter into to illuminate us. There's a lot to talk about with solar and lunar, but that's sort of the flavor. More questions? No? Okay. One more? Yeah. How, is there a test to know whether a scripture is true or not? Yeah, and to know that, you have to awaken consciousness. That's the tricky part. Um, there are a lot of great scriptures that we can study, that we accept as good indications of the path. And those are the teachings of the great masters, Muhammad, Krishna, Buddha, Jesus, etc. Beyond that, it can become questionable. There are other great texts, other great scriptures. But to really know if a scripture is good, you have to test it through your own experience. right? You have to test what it teaches and experience the results of that. And in these times, there's not a lot of time for playing around. So it's best for us to focus on what's tried and true, what can make a great revolution in our own consciousness, that we can experience develop, you know, development in ourselves quickly. So we would point towards 
the Gospels of Jesus, the Sutras and Tantras of the Buddha, uh, the Quran, the Bhagavad Gita and the other sacred scriptures of Hinduism, the Tao Te Ching, texts like that. Tried and true, the Popol Vuh is another good example, the Eddas from Germany. Um, those types of texts, those very elevated, you know, thousands of years of being beneficial to humanity. Those are the kinds of things we want to refer to. In the sense, we have to in the beginning, yeah. But the best thing is to take and study those teachings and put them into practice on a daily basis. And when you do that, you start to actualize them. But to do that takes a lot of effort. It's easy to read something and study it and say, oh yeah, I get that. But to do it, that's difficult. The presentation of this lecture was made possible by donations from listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most Gnostic schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every single donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticRadio.org. For questions and deeper understanding of this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Glorian Publishing and available from booksellers worldwide. Visit GnosticBooks.org to learn more. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Mm -hmm.